Amen. Welcome home. We're glad you're here today in Pittsburgh and in Columbus this morning. We are so glad you're here today. And God is good. Amen. Amen. God is so good today. And I just want to give somebody a little bit of hope today. I just sense God's presence today. Well, I'm excited today. You're going to get to hear uh, from three different people in the message today. I believe today that God wants to speak to our hearts here in Pittsburgh and in Columbus today. And for that to happen this morning, we just have to be open today to what God wants to say to us. Amen. So I just trust that you'd be open to what the Lord wants to say to you today as we wrap up our series called Responsibility. What you do next is all that matters. And we've been, if you've been here for a while, you know that uh, we've been saying during this series, your response after something happens is your responsibility. And if you're new and you're hearing that for the first time, it's simply saying how we respond after something happens. You know, like when your two-year-old takes a magic marker and writes on the wall, how you respond. When you have an argument with someone that you care about, how do you respond? When you fail, when you do something you shouldn't do or someone else fails and they do something that they shouldn't do, how do you respond? We've been saying that God cares about how we respond because it's in those moments that we either reflect him or we reflect the nature of ourselves or we give a bad light to who God is. Today, as we're wrapping up this series, we're going to talk about called out. Here's the question we're going to ask today. How do you respond when God calls you out? Let's read that in both locations. How do you respond when God calls you out? Man, that's a big one today. Because if you are following God or you desire to follow God or you're interested in knowing what it would take to follow God, the reality is for all three of us in that scenario, if we're following God, he is going to call us out. And sometimes he'll call us out in, in little ways. Sometimes he'll call us out in big ways, in mundane, on mundane ways. But he calls us out. Sometimes he calls us out for just daily plans. Like if you ever just, you wanted to have your day, like you had in the morning you were going to do this, and in the afternoon you were going to do this, and in the evening you were going to do this, and then all of a sudden your plans are wrecked. Sometimes God calls you out. He allows things to happen a certain way for a reason. And so this morning, if we're following God, he calls us out just with daily plans. Did you know that sometimes when you run into somebody at the mall and you think it's just a random thing and they encourage you or you happen to give them a word of encouragement, you didn't just run into them. That was a divine appointment. Those are the daily plans. Sometimes, if you're like me, you get called out for behavior modification, like when you're playing your son in basketball on a video game. My son got this PS4, which is like this video game, for those of you who don't know anything about that. And we were playing, we play basketball in the evening together every once in a while. Okay, maybe a little bit more than every once in a while. Before bed, and the dude, just my 13-year-old, I think it's because I'm older and my fingers don't work, you know, the way they used to, but he just always beats me and it makes me so stinking mad. And so sometimes uh, I don't handle that very well. Like sometimes I'll say, um, I'm not finishing the game, I'm leaving, or you're cheating. I mean, things like that, you know, come out my mouth or, you know, uh, (laughs) other stuff like I'm just frustrated or whatever. Okay. And so sometimes God will call me out and I'll have to say, you know, the next morning, Noah, I'm sorry I got frustrated last night when we were playing a video game, right? And that's a silly illustration, but he does call us out with behavior modification sometimes. In fact, one of the first things that he does as we follow him is he begins to chisel at that, our behavior. Another thing that he'll do, and you're going to hear about it a little bit later, is he'll call us out with a life purpose. Maybe we're called into ministry. Maybe we're called into a certain field. Maybe we're called to do something specific that is going to impact the rest of our life and the lives of other people. He'll call us out that way, out that way. And the reality is, is when he does call us out, God doesn't get it wrong. Amen. If he's calling you out, he's not going to quit, quit calling you. He's going to continue to call you out. 
And then there's other reasons that he calls us out, all kinds of different other reasons. I got to thinking about in my life, I kind of had the art of avoiding God's call, especially when I was 16 years old and he called me to be a pastor. I was really good at the, the three things I'm getting ready to tell you, but it's not just me. All of us, when we, God calls us, even in big ways or small ways even, we sometimes have this art of avoiding God's call, right? One of the ways is just to keep God at an arm's length by just kind of keeping our distance, right? Have you ever just avoided someone because you knew it was going to be kind of a tense conversation? Or you've avoided someone because you just don't want to hear what they have to say, right? Sometimes we do that with God. Sometimes we're afraid to have that quiet time with God. But we know that we need to. Am I the only one that does that? So we'll just, you know, we'll read, read our scripture for the day. You know, we'll get our little... Oswald Chambers or whatever you guys use, you know, and we read it and if we use the version app or something like that, we'll check that off for the day, but we'll make our prayer kind of short or we'll just pray, but we won't do the listening part. We'll just do the talking part. That's kind of how, what we do. It's like we keep God at an arm's distance because we're afraid of what he might say. My kids try that every once in a while with me when they know that, you know, they should have done something they didn't do. Like, hey, Dad, what's going on? And they'll just kind of leave the room. I'm like, Noah. And then all of a sudden he kind of gets selective hearing because he doesn't want to have the conversation. We do that. We do that with God. We keep him at an arm's length. Another way that we can do what God wants, delay what God wants us to do is simply by delay doing what God said with excuses as to why now is not the time. So excuse one is to keep him at a distance. Excuse two is to, okay, we're going to have the conversation, and I'll listen to you, but I'm not going to do it right now, right? The other day, I'm like, Grace, you need to go out and feed the dog. Okay, Dad, you mean like now or like tomorrow? Like now, sis. Well, I've just got a lot to do right now. What, look at your iPad? No, go outside and feed the dog. And that's a silly illustration, and you guys might not be able to identify with that illustration, but what we can all identify with is we delay God, don't we? Because sometimes we think that a delayed yes is a yes, but really a delayed yes is a no. See, obedience is simply saying yes to God. Another thing that we can do, which kind of goes along with this one, but maybe not the, ex- the same, is always making sure that God's calling is on our priority list. It's just not the, at the top of the list. You know what I'm saying? It's like for me, I have two or three projects my wife wants me to do, and I'm not ignoring them. I just never get around to doing those because I know those are going to be time consuming. So they're on the list, but I always find a reason why I can't do that one today or tomorrow. You know, and man, we do that with God. He'll call us out to talk to someone about God. He'll call us out to apologize to someone. And we're not telling God we won't. We're just telling God, maybe not today. We're not telling God that we'll answer the call to ministry. We're just saying we're not going to do that today. We're not saying we're going to have that tough talk with that person that God's telling us to have that tough talk with. We're just saying we're not going to do that today. You know where I'm going with this. And the reality is we can master the art. In fact, churches are filled with this. It's called lukewarm. Because we know enough about God that we believe in God and we love God. But we also know enough about God that we're not, we still want control and we know he's going to try to have control. So we just kind of delay what God wants to do and we master the art of never letting God corner us. And sometimes we go through our whole life doing that. And we're always left empty and we're always left frustrated and we're always left feeling like there's got to be more to this than this, and there is, and the reason why we're not experiencing it, stay with me now, <clears throat> is because you are really good at mastering the art of keeping God right here. He's welcome, just not here, just right here. And the Bible says that we all give an account for our lives, which means that our response is our responsibility. Let's say that together. My response is my responsibility. That's true. 
We each, for our own lives, decide how we're going to respond when God calls us. Our response, when God calls us, it matters to God. Because it tells him if we are fans or if we are followers. Some of us are familiar with the story of Abram, who later became Abraham. Some of us aren't, but if you have your Bibles of the YouVersion app, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. If not, uh, we've got it on the screen. But we're going to be jumping around in Abraham's life because there's three different instances <clears throat> where God calls Abram out. Three different instances where God calls Abram out, and we're going to look at how Abraham responds. So what takes place is, Abram is obviously a guy that God has, has chosen. He's chosen. Excuse me. He's chosen Abram to, to, to some great things. He's got a life purpose for Abram. But what takes place is, is that in order for God to, to use Abram, he's got to call Abram out of his comfort zone. And sometimes when we're called out of our comfort zone, that's where we can delay the calling. But Abram doesn't. The, God, Lord, the Lord says to Abram, hey, listen, I want you to leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. So he's telling, he's telling Abram, he's calling him out, he's saying, he's saying, I want you to go, I don't only want you to go, I want to take away every crutch you have. I want to take away every support system that you have. Did you know sometimes God takes your crutch away? Because he wants you to realize that God is supposed to be your crutch, not your mom. <laughs> not your dad. Not your friends. I want you to leave the familiar so that you depend on me not somebody else. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. You know, sometimes God doesn't tell us why, but he does Abram here. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who treat you with contempt. So Abraham has this calling. God calls him to leave the familiar for the unfamiliar. Let's read that together. God called Abram to leave the familiar for the unfamiliar. Now, Scripture doesn't say if, if he argued with God. My guess would be that he didn't. If he did, it wasn't much or probably would have been recorded. Because we see throughout the Bible where people will wrestle with God, and then they finally will. I mean, Jonah, right? He wrestled with God. If it was a big wrestling thing, then probably would have been recorded. I would, I would guess that pretty much Abram just did what he was asked. So Abram departed... As the Lord instructed. Let's read that together. So Abram departed as the Lord instructed. See, faith is willing to leave the known for the unknown, not because it's safe, but because he asks. Let me say that again. Faith is willing to leave the known for the unknown, not because it's safe, but because he asks. But because he asks. Say that with me in both locations. But because he asks. I shared with you last week that there was a student that went to the first week of teen camp this year. And while she was at camp, God called her into ministry. That girl's name is Haley Valley. And Haley is here with us this morning. And she's going to just share with you how God has called her and what God's done in her life. So let's welcome Haley as she comes today. <clears throat> and so Haley, you had an encounter with God at camp where you answered his call. Tell us a little bit about that and whatever else you'd like to share with that. Um, so at camp, I did... Um, say yes to my calling to ministry. However, it wasn't the first time that I had been feeling um, called to that. The first time was actually my first time at camp back in seventh grade. However, everything in my life and my mentality was completely off. I was like, oh God, like, I think you're making a mistake. Maybe you're trying to talk to that girl over there, but like, you're not talking to me. 
because everything in my life was not going along with that idea. And so since then, every time I got real close in my um, relationship with God, I always backed up because that calling always came back. It was something that I could never get rid of, even though I really, really wanted to. And so at camp this year, um, I have done a lot of spiritual growth in this past uh, couple, like six, seven months. So I was feeling God, and I knew that he was saying that in the back of my mind, but I was like, you know what, God, please just give me a sign. And he gave me 12 within six hours. And (laughs) so I was uh, arguing. So you still weren't sure, right? I I still wasn't sure, honestly. I was arguing with myself and with Pastor Garrett. And I was going through all these reasons, like, I can't because, like, of my, my family's abusive, or I can't because, like, I've struggled with poverty, or I can't because I struggle with depression. And Garrett cut me off, and he said, Haley, you asked God to give you a sign. He has given you several. You can either keep moving, like, the finish line and keep making an excuse, but it's not going to change that you asked, he answered, and now it's time to say yes or no. That's good. Let's give God a hand. That is awesome. <clears throat> So part of it is just sharing your story. And the second piece is somebody else may be in your boat. They're not at camp with you, but they're here today. And maybe, maybe they're older than you. Maybe they're the same age as you, age as you. But I believe today that the Holy Spirit's speaking to someone here or someone in Columbus who God's asking you to leave the familiar in some way. So what would you say to someone who's feeling called by God to leave the familiar and embrace the unfamiliar when you've kind of been going through that yourself? Um, my best advice as a teenager would be to YOLO, which is you only live once. Yeah. Um, because like this is this was what was going through my head was that like I only have so much time on this earth. Do I really want to spend, you know, five more years, ten more years, or the rest of my life pushing off God and pretending like I don't know what's going on when I could be doing what he what he's asking me to? Yeah. So. My first advice is to YOLO, and second is to realize that he's got your back. I uh, like to think of Peter Mm -hmm. whenever he was called to walk on the water. Walking on water is not something that humans can do. I have tried very many times at the public pool. And so obviously, (laughs) like, Peter probably wasn't so so sure about getting out on the water. But he took a step of faith, and he kept his eyes on the Lord. And while he did that, he was staying afloat. He was, he was killing it. Yeah. And as soon as he lost his way, he started to sink. But he called out to be saved, and he was saved by Jesus. That's so good. I guess my That's point good. is to take a step of faith, because no yeah. matter what happens, if you look back at him, he's going to help you, and he's going to guide you through it. Mm, girl, you can preach. That's good. <clears throat> That's good. YOLO. I'm trying to listen to her, but I'm thinking that's a sermon series right there. (laughs) You only live once, right? So if we're going to live once, let's make a difference for God. So we see that. Thank you so much, Haley. We also see where God calls Abraham to believe the impossible is possible. See, for God to call Abraham to believe that the impossible is possible, he had to get him out of his comfort zone. He had to get him out of the familiar See, he couldn't tell him step one, step two until he was faithful with step one. Come on. So some of us, we want step two and three and four, but we're not willing to do the first step. Amen? So what we see Abraham doing the, step, the first step is, which is leaving mom and dad and everybody else and going out and, and, and doing what God wants him to do, leaving everything. And it's during that point that God calls Abraham to believe the impossible is possible. See, what takes place in this story is... God calls Abraham and Sarah to have a baby, which doesn't seem like that big of a deal in terms of, I mean, every, you know, most people obviously adopt or they at least want a kid or they have a kid. But in this story, Abraham and Sarah are 190 years old. Abraham's 100 and Sarah is 90 years old. Okay. So God tells Abraham, Hey, here's the deal. I'm going to bless your wife and she's going to have a son. I'm going to bless her richly, and she will become the mother of many nations. Now, for years, Sarah has been barren. Now she's not just barren, she's old and barren. Okay? So you can imagine, if she's old and barren, and God's saying, you're going to be the mother of many nations, I mean, that's kind of a hard thing on paper to believe. 
You know, sometimes God calls us to believe the impossible, to pray for the impossible. And folks, I'm here to tell you, I wish I could tell you stories, but I can't because I'd break confidence with people of marriages just in our church that have been restored, of people's lives who've been delivered from addictions. And it starts with believing that the impossible is possible. So what takes place is Abraham and Sarah, they, they don't, I don't know that they mean it disrespectfully, but they kind of laugh. That's Abraham's responsibility. He, he's, he laughs in disbelief. He says, how can I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she's 99 years old? Not 90, 99 years old. I mean, How? How could I be called into ministry? I'm 74 years old. Why would God call me to go on a mission trip? I'm handicapped. Why would God call me to go back to school? I'm 54. See, God is the God of the impossible. God says, nah, 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 nah. Sarah, your wife will give birth to a son for you. See, faith is believing what God said even when it doesn't make sense in your head. Come on. Faith is believing what God said even when it doesn't make sense in your head. That's a tweet. Let's read that. Faith is believing what God said even when it doesn't make sense in your head. I've said it a million times. Stop doing the math. Start believing. Some of us know Heidi Casper. Probably a lot of us don't in in Columbus, but Heidi Casper is a great lady who's at our church. Her husband's a children's pastor. We're going to welcome Heidi. Let's give her a hand today. And for those that don't know Heidi and don't know Pastor Thomas, they have just rocked it with this foster care thing in our community. And uh, but. You know, believe in the po- impossible is possible. You about didn't get here today. How many people did you have in your house last night? Uh, 12 children. She had 12 kids in her house last night. Now, some of that was family, yeah. extended family. Some of it was foster care kids. So just believing it was possible to get here was a good deal. But in the last, how long have you been doing foster care? We've been doing uh, foster care officially uh, two and a half years. Two and a half years. Now, before we go any farther, Thomas and Heidi on paper... Should be the last ones to do foster care. How many kids do you have? Five biological. Five, five children, okay? So on paper, you should be the last ones to do it, and yet God's calling you to do that, yes. right? Talk yes. about that for a minute. So in the past two and a half years, um, I, I, we honestly believe God has called us uh, to be a safe place for children in the midst of a storm. So in two and a half years, besides our five biological children, we've had over 60 um, children. Um, Let's give God a hand. That is awesome. Um, I believe whether it's foster care or anything that you're being called into, um, if God calls you to it, God will get you through it. That's good. Um, so yes, it's, it's a little crazy at times. Yeah. Let's be honest. It can be a lot crazy. (laughs) Okay. So here's my question. What would you say to someone who's battling between what God is saying, and it doesn't have, like you said, it doesn't have to be foster care, it could be anything, what God is saying and what their own logic is saying? Well, I would say three things. Number one is say yes, um, but say yes even when it seems impossible. Um, Say yes when it's inconvenient, and say yes um, even when you're tired. I have seen God um, provide for us when we've said yes to the impossible. taking in additional children, like yesterday when we got a call and we already had 10 children in our home, but there were children that needed a safe place in the midst of a storm. Um, God has provided through other people um, that I believe are being called also. Um, I know it seems silly sometimes, but it might be with chickens or um, uh, hamburger meat or um, diapers and wipes. So God is calling other people to help us. So um, in the midst of that impossible, God provides. So what would you say to this? You said impossible, inconvenient, and tired. So you're saying that uh, to say yes to God, even when it seems impossible, even when it's inconvenient, and even when 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 you're tired. So let me ask you this. Do you think 
you're actually saying yes to God if you're not saying yes when it feels impossible, when it's inconvenient, and when you're tired. Are you really saying yes? No, yeah. because then you're doing it on your own strength. That's good. Um, it, you need God's strength. God can't fill you up unless you're um, empty. And so it's, it's God's strength. Um, say yes. Amen. So. Amen. Let's give God a hand. Thank you, Heidi. That's good. That's good. You know, God calls us to all kinds of things. Amen. Amen. So what takes place, right? Abraham and, and, and Sarah, they're going to have this kid. And then they, at some point, they have this child. You can imagine, like, how excited they are. Their first child. I mean, they seen God's hand. They, they saw where God, you know, made the impossible possible by being able to have a child at 99 years old. And then the unthinkable happens. How do you respond when the unthinkable happens? God and Abraham have a talk, right? God's ha or Abraham's having his quiet time with God. And God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to trust me with the unthinkable. God calls Abraham to trust him with the unthinkable. And here's what he says. I want you to go and sacrifice your only kid on an altar, which I will show you. See, back then, in order to make things right with God, we didn't have Jesus to invite in our heart. Jesus existed, but he hadn't died on the cross yet. So for people to have right relationship with God, they would take their best animal or offering or whatever God told them to do, and they would sacrifice that as an appeasement to God. That was very common, but it wasn't common for you to sacrifice your child as an offering to God. And yet God is asking Abraham to do that. And he says, God himself, as, as Abraham goes to, to take his child up the mountain, the child's used to going with Abraham and seeing that there's a sacrifice and he's looking around and he's not seeing a sheep or a goat or whatever else that he might sacrifice. And he finally looks at his dad and says, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. See, faith isn't trusting that God will deliver you from the mess. Faith is going into the mess and trusting that God will handle the rest. Come on now. So they get up the mountain. He ties him up. He's willing to do what God tells him to do. And God stops him and says, hey, you weren't going to do that. I just wanted to see that you were going to trust me. Hey, there's, a, there's an animal over there in the thicket. Sacrifice him. See, faith is walking into the mess and stop trying to figure out if God is going to deliver you from it. It's just being obedient. Some of us are trying to do the math whether, so whether we can decide whether we're going to step out or not. Show me a little bit, God. I don't need 100%. Just give me 10% of what's going to happen so I have something. God says, no. No. Faith isn't trusting that I'm going to deliver you. Faith is going into the mess and trusting that I got the rest of it. There's a lot of stories and examples of that. There was this lady named Irina Sindler that she was a huge uh, person who saved a bunch of babies during the, during the World War II, during the Jewish Holocaust. And Jessica Ripper actually did a paper on this a uh, lady in high school, and long story short, there's a museum actually in Fort Scott that, uh, let's welcome Jessica as she comes up. Come on up, Jessica. And some of you maybe have been to Fort Scott. There's actually a museum there that tells about Irina Sendler's life, but you got to actually go over to Germany and, and visit her. Tell us a little bit about Irina. So in 1999, we developed a play about Irina, just about the Holocaust. Uh, we wanted to know a little bit more about people that stepped out of their comfort zone and said yes. And we learned about Irina. She saved 2,500 Jewish children from the Warsaw Ghetto during the Holocaust and went to, um, we went to Poland to meet her. She was absolutely amazing. To say that someone stepped out of that comfort zone to went, and went into that mess um, as an understatement, she went into the ghetto daily, risking her life and her entire family. Um, if anyone would have known that she was going in there to save children, her entire family would have been shot, her entire family. And she had a son and a daughter. 
But Irina did that. She risked her life daily to go in and was able to save 2,500. And eventually we were able to talk to her and go meet with her three different trips to Poland and ask her what her, you know, why did you do that? Why, did, why, why would you risk your life? Why would you risk your children's lives? And what she kept telling us was, I was called to do it. Um, if I was, if I didn't, who would have? Who would have yeah. stepped out in faith? And and that's why we shared her story. That's why we developed the play. That's why we traveled all over the U.S., Canada, and Poland. Um, that's why her story was picked up by the Today Show and CNN and um, the Ladies Home Journal is because that story is something that we can all connect to. We can, we all have to step out in faith, no matter what your situation is, no matter how dirty, no matter how unthinkable. You all have your own situations where you step out in faith and, and do what God has asked you to do, just like Irina did. And you know, while she saved 2,500 children. I, I, I'm not going to get anywhere close to touching that many lives, but, um, you know, when you think about it, 2,500 is just the children she saved. That's not the children and grandchildren that those kids were able to go on and have and the families and the lives that they were able to touch. That's good. I asked Jessica to share because I want to come from a different angle for just a minute, and here's why. Sometimes God calls us to do things that are scary and risky, like being a missionary, like protecting someone and, and being persecuted for it. Like, I don't know what it is. In fact, I'm at peace about it because I feel like if, if you're being talked to by God, he's filling in the blank instead of me. Because up until this point, you know, we're talking about things that, that, are, that are difficult but not almost impossible. Sometimes God will call you to the unthinkable and to get into the mess of someone else in such a way that maybe you can't get out of it. So if there was someone in that boat today that's being called to step out in a way that's, that's scary or risky or unsafe, because the truth is, Irina, which there's lots of stories, you know, where people have risked their lives, but, I mean, she was trying to save kids, but at any point she could have been killed, right? So if someone you feel like is being called out of the boat in some way um, like this or whatever, what would your advice be? My advice is to step out in faith and to know that, even if something is going to happen to you, because uh, like Irina, she was eventually found and everything was fractured from the waist down. She was taken to prison. She was beaten. They tried to find the names of the children, but she never gave up one child. She had faith that God was going to bring her to the situation and he was also going to bring her through. And that, I mean, that's the advice that I would give anyone. It's not going to be an easy situation. He's not telling you he's going to bring you to a situation that you're going to breeze right through, because if you breeze right through it, it's not him in the situation that's bringing you through. It's your own faith. That's good. That's good. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much. So here's, here's our question that we asked just a little bit ago. How do you respond when God calls you out? So we're believing today that this message is for someone. Today, I probably am aware that this type of a sermon is maybe not for every single person. Maybe it is. But our prayer today is for this one person this, today here, or two people here, or whatever, that one person in Columbus, or two, or whatever, that God is calling you out in some way. Maybe it's like Haley, where God's calling you into ministry, and you've been ignoring it. Maybe it's just that you would start to believe the impossible is poss impossible. Maybe it's foster care. Maybe it's just to believe your marriage is worth saving. Maybe it's to believe that, that it's going to get better. I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. Or maybe today, God, you're in the unthinkable situation, and you're sitting around maybe feeling sorry for yourself, maybe even with good reason. Maybe you're feeling like that you can't handle this unthinkable, because it would involve risk or it involve you getting out of your comfort zone. And yet for some reason, you're being called to do that. What would happen? And just think about this. And we say this word a lot at the end of the sermons. So it's easy sometimes to get desensitized to it. But imagine today. Think about it. If you would just be faithful to whatever God's telling you this morning. Can we just, can we just bow our heads and close our eyes for just a minute? This is that moment in the message where we're able to respond to God. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you right now? What is he calling you to do? How is he asking you to step out of the boat? 
Is he calling you away from the familiar? Is he calling you to believe the impossible? Is he calling you just to trust him with what just feels so unthinkable? What if you just stopped doing the math and you just said yes today? Columbus, what if you just said yes? What if you just said, God, yes, today? So we just want to give you a moment today to listen to God and simply say, yes, God. If he's speaking to you right now, what if you just said, yes? God, sometimes we fill space with words, but sometimes our heart's groaning louder than our words. And Father, I pray if there's someone here today or in Columbus that you're speaking to, I pray they would just say yes. And some of us need to keep wrestling with it to make sure that we're hearing right, but some of us have been hearing it a long time and we know. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if in some way, or as a testimony to God, if in some way you said yes to being called out, would you just slip your hand up this morning? God, you see those hands in Columbus and here in Pittsburgh today. Thank you, Lord, that you don't get it wrong. Thank you that you're patient with us. Thank you that you use us. I pray today there would be some hard yeses. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's stand in both locations and worship this morning.